on this computer. Shri, you can start. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining today. Uh, today, I will be talking about graph neural networks. A uh, little bit about myself. Uh, I am Shreya Patil. Uh, I have a master's degree in data science. And currently, I am working as a research fellow at uh, FDA. So uh, my last uh, semester's project was kind of based on uh, and like very complex data set. And that's how I begin my fellowship here uh, at FDA. And in my coming research, I will be working on a graph neural networks. So uh, this is uh, kind of, I did a little bit of my background uh, study on it. And I would like to share whatever my understanding is here, like overview of the graph neural network. So uh, let's get started. Uh, to define a graph neural network, uh, we can say as, um, this this is a model which try to learn a graph data and do the prediction on it. So the uh, GNN builds an uh, internal representation and embedding of a vectors for each node. And we know that uh, node and nodes are connected with each other with the edges and which can be represented as a uh, E here and V as a vertices, and the function of this is we collectively, we call it as a uh, graph. So we can do the embedding of a data for the vertex as a person or a place, and connection between two person, that means like relation can be defined with the edges. So consider it as a friend or spouse. So that connection is embedded into the edges. And collectively, the group of uh, people and the relation between them, we can define as a global relation. S say, maybe we can say as a family. So this is an example of uh, data which can be converted into graph using vertex vertexes and edges. So what we just talked about, these are the primary attributes in any graph. And the relation between two nodes can be directed on or uh, undirected edges as well. So what are the uh, examples of a graph data, uh, which can, I mean, the data which can be transformed into graph, as we talked about uh, social media network where uh, nodes are acting as a person and relation between them are edges. Uh, chem informatics data, this is another very important application of graph neural network. Uh, where atoms and bonds between them collectively define a single molecule. Another uh, example can be image data. Image data can be again uh, represented as a graph data where each node acts as a, a pixel and connection between adjacent nodes are defined with the edges. Uh, text data, for text data as well, it goes similar. We can uh, derive uh, adjacent matrix from the text data and connection between them, like a sequence data. And then that adjacent matrix can be converted into a graph, defining each uh, matrix node uh, cell as a independent node. So uh, let's consider why uh, it is very uh, difficult to analyze graph data because first important reason is the complexity of a graph data. In the image uh, here we can graph, we can see that image data and text data are like fairly similar and predictable structures they have. I mean, it is very symmetric and we can have uh, sequential nodes attached to each other and we can get image or text data. But as compared to this, uh, Graph data is very, very complex. Uh, there are multiple nodes and there are multiple connections happening. So it is uh, ML, uh, machine learning, current machine learning algorithms can get very overwhelmed with this much complexity of the data. Another reason is uh, current machine learning algorithms are kind of designed in a way that 
they need a fixed size of input, which can be difficult to give in a uh, graphs because graphs can, uh, based on the examples, gra graphs can change their sizes as well. And another fundamental difference between uh, current uh, machine learning algorithms assumption is that uh, current machine learning algorithms assume that each input node is uh, an individual instance. They are not dependent on another input node. But this is a very different for graph uh, structural data because they are connected with another nodes and their connection has a very important information in that. So that plays very important role in a uh, prediction of the required, either it can be node or a relation. So these are the few points which makes uh, different uh, sets graph data apart from image or text data. So <clears throat> graph neural networks uh, are can be trained on just one graph. Uh, to train it, we need to provide a graph structure and nodes uh, features. Uh, once trained, it can uh, see the patterns in node and can do predictions, uh, find anomalies. Those predictions can be three types of predictions, like uh, predicting the node level predictions, edge level prediction, and global level predictions as well. GNNs uh, can also be trained on uh, multiple graphs. So, uh, and also pre-trained uh, pre GNNs are also available. So the two important papers which kind of brought uh, graph neural networks in the discussions are first released in uh, 2005, which is a neural network models for graphs. And another one is a convolutional neural network on graphs with fast localized uh, spectral filtering. This is a very important paper, I would say, because uh, it kind of modified the current uh, CNN model for a graph data. To give a normal uh, flow of the data in GNN, uh, this can be our input graph. Then these are the GNN blocks where graph related uh, transformation of graph is happened without changing its structure where it shares the uh, information between each other we will talk about this uh, in coming slides and then after this uh, after this gnn block transformation the normal neural network uh, methods are applied and the predictions can be made so why does current neural network um, uh, methods that can be like a CNN won't work on graphs. If you remember that uh, CNN uh, kind of has one um, kernel function, which is a, like a window function, which we move over the image and we will try to convert convolution into another sample size. Here we can see this window is of a fixed size and even the images are, a, are very fixed size. This is very hard to find in a graph data. So the arbitrary size of the graph kind of becomes difficult to handle by CNNs. And again, the complex topology of the graphs. And one important factor is that uh, if we consider this image and if we flip it upside down, we get a different image. So that is a different image input we can give to the a CNN model. But if we do the same thing with the graph, then graph has not changed. Like its meaning is not changing. We are just changing the ordering of the node. But even though changing the ordering, we, are, we will get different adjacent matrix and it can produce a different results. So we don't want to do that. And to address that problem, we need to consider a graph convolutional neural network. So what happens in uh, GCNN? If we consider uh, this example where this molecule is represented as a graph and each node is holding the information about, sorry, uh, each node is holding the information about itself, like what it is connected to. Same goes for all the nodes. And then the GNN block, which we discussed previously, where message processing happens and each node shares the information about each other and now collectively 
collectively we get a, a vector fe feature vector which has the information about the whole graph uh, okay, this graph uh, this image kind of shows it uh, nicely that first node doesn't know that node number five is existing because its connection is only expanding to three, uh, two, three, and four. So at timestamp one, this is the learning of the all the nodes. And when the first message passing uh, layer uh, happens, each node shares the information to its neighbor nodes. And then here we can see they are sharing and aggregating, and then they are sharing this updated information with each other. So now you can see that this information is shared here as well. And again, the aggregation step happens and the information about fifth node is shared with all other nodes. The green blocks can uh, here are indicating that. So how many message passing layers to include can be depending on the size of the graph. And this becomes a hyperparameter tuning part where uh, your model learns itself and based on that it will try to uh, decide how many message passing uh, blocks you want to include in your GCNN. So uh, ju what just what we talked about a GCNN uh, it was published in the paper called uh, semi-supervised classification with the graph convolution network. Then another important paper uh, which talks about uh, graph sage. So graph sage is a, a representation of a learning technique for a dynamic graph. And uh, it can predict the embedding of a new node without needing a retraining procedure. And in graph attention network, uh, graph attention network tries to uh, give the importance to the important factor of the containing data and then uh, we we talk about graph transformer networks so uh, gtns uses uh, use multiple attention heads to capture different uh, aspects of a node relations and it incorporate the positional recording for handling node order so this is kind of a uh, Normal CNN or RNN or LSTM get transfer, uh, they evolve to transformer using attention mechanism. So attention mechanism can be said as a, what the fundamental is that context vectors should have access to all parts of the input sequence instead of just the last one. So what RNN and LSTM tries to do is that they will try to hold the information from a previous uh, input layer, but it has a limitation. So it can hold the information up to certain limit of the layer. But to get the whole idea about graph, that algorithm should have capacity of holding the information of all the linkage of the nodes. So that's where it uh, GCNN sets apart from the uh, L, uh, RNN or LSTM. Graph transformer uh, networks work by first representing the graph as a sequence of a node and edges. And the nodes are then embedded into vector space and the edges are represented as a matrix of fits. So what I just talked about is if you consider this image and uh, if we are trying to identify the linkage between the nodes, attention mechanism will try to focus on these uh, nodes which are linked to each other than focusing on the individual nodes. Uh, about Hugging Face, uh, Hugging Face is the place where we can find uh, open source pre-trained AI models. So currently there are um, pre-trained gra graph transformers available on Hugging Face. That is a graph former or a graph transformer and graph VIT. Uh, VIT. So these uh, pre-trained models uh, can be used to find the, uh, to predict the link predictions and graph classification activities, 
also for uh, language processing tasks such as uh, text classification and question answering and particularly graph vit can be used for uh, computer vision tasks such as uh, image classification and object detection the typical application of graph neural network uh, just what we talked about is a social network analysis uh, recommendation system uh, knowledge graph completions and most importantly where currently gnns are at most use is drug discovery method where model molecular structures as a graph and predict the properties so those properties can be drug efficiency toxicology or the binding affinity of drug molecule to the biological mo molecule or a, or a protein mo molecule so finding that connectivity and predicting that connectivity that's where gnn plays very important roles uh, again, computer vision, fraud anomaly detection, NLP models, and uh, another application can be traffic predictions as well. Uh, GNN plus LLMs. GNN and LLMs can be used together uh, to increase the efficiency of the model because GNN has the capacity, uh, like, uh, works better at understanding and processes the relationship between entities, whereas LLMs uh, understands or processes the natural language model. So we can use the combination of these uh, two types of models and we can create the system that can, which is capable of performing complex tasks uh, that would be difficult or impossible to do with the either, either of the single model. Uh, just, uh, examples can be using to understand the natural language or using it in the question answering chatbot and again using it for a drug discovery where uh, graph GNNs can hold the structure of molecules and large language model can use uh, can understand the properties of that molecule and co with combination with that we can try to predict the uh, properties of a new molecule. This is the simplest example which we can consider for a drug discovery. Uh, currently, uh, Google AIs, uh, OpenAI and DeepMinds, they are kind of using these uh, GNNs and LLMs together uh, in their applications. So uh, I would just give an um, overview about what I will be doing in coming months using a graph neural network. So as I said, uh, I, I will be working at FDA and if over the years, FDA has collected a data of an adverse uh, event happened due to drugs. So whenever... Uh, medication error reports and product quality reports complaints are filed to uh, FDA. They have a huge data set which collects all this data and they are trying to analyze that data and find the patterns in that data. So according to uh, CDC, more than 1 million individual each year go to hospital due to only a adverse drug reactions. So you can imagine how serious this issue is. So by analyzing this data, we will be able to find a pattern or we will be able to uh, focus on particular types of drugs and why the adverse reactions are happening with that. So these kind of uh, questions can be answered due to analysis of the network. So currently, uh, FDA is using network analysis method but they are using it on a uh, vaccine data because vaccine data is very uh, smaller as compared to the drug data where there are like only uh, six or uh, 400 nodes available, but the connection between them goes for like 1.4 million connection between each uh, vaccine and their side effect. This graph here kind of gives an uh, idea about this is a whole uh, graph 
with the all the nodes and this is a subset where uh, red nodes are representing different uh, vaccines and uh, green ones are representing their side effects so and the connection between them is and the thickness of this connection is kind of a representation of number of counts this connection has occurred and through this uh, graph we will try to identify the hub node so currently this seems like a hub node because it has many connections so above some threshold if that hub node has connections then that particular vaccine or that particular side effect can be analyzed manually so this is how they are currently processing the um, vaccine data but eventually i will be working on uh, identifying the connection between drug molecules and their side effects because drug molecules and their side effect becomes complex than a vaccine data because at a single time person can be taking multiple drugs and we need to consider the fact that the combination of that two drugs may be creating that side effect not only those individual elements so that can be a very complex data set and we will be trying to use a graph neural network model to analyze that uh, that's the goal uh, that's it for today i have uh, included few of the important links which i am using for my study thank you so much for listening okay uh, thank you <laughs> well i never used graph networks <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's a, I mean, it's a very, I am also at very initial stage of understanding it. So, yeah, let's see how it goes. Yeah, yeah I, I've, I have a couple of just very simple questions. A very nice talk and nice slides too. So thank, thank you. you. Um, so you, the very last thing you were saying, so in your models, the edges can have different weights different values it's not just zero or one yeah okay so, and go ahead yeah yeah continue your question sorry about that uh, the other question is uh any of the links bi-directional and if it's bi-directional can they have different values so doing bi-directional is kind of uh because connections are like uh symptom and the drug so it can be I don't think it is a directional graph. It is just an undirectional graph. And the edges have number of counts, means if multiple persons are reporting that same uh, side effect by getting that same vaccine, then the edge value is kind of increasing. Okay. So that's the edge value. And could the edges be negative? Uh, I don't think it will be negative. It will be uh, one or beyond, uh, uh, about that. Okay, and when you're creating this network, are you embedding it in a dimension so that the links that uh, cross on the picture don't actually cross? Yeah, it's a multidimensional. It's not a two-dimensional graph only. And it um, so things change between two and three dimensions, so you can go over things. So do you need to ever embed it in higher dimensions? No, I haven't done like any embedding personally on that data yet. So that's what I will be doing in coming months. So maybe I will, I can be able to answer you better. Okay. And um, do, the, do the nodes have values? Yeah, nodes have the values of uh, vaccine product and the side effect. So nodes hold those values. It's 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 just the sum of the incoming uh, um, um, of the incoming. Company. Yeah. Okay. So uh, and what what why do you want to do a linear model like that? I mean, in a certain sense, the heart of neural networks was to make things nonlinear. So the nodes on a neural network depend on a nonlinear function on the weights. So uh, there are multiple approaches have been like uh, there. I mean, I am one of the person who are who is working on this project using GNN model. 
like we we will be trying to use it i am not sure whether it will work or not will not work so again this is everything is just a hypothesis right now at current stage and as, as we go and do some like a sample data set use it and try to do it and look at the results then we able to tell like whether it is working or not okay now what one thing that that people are whether rightly or wrongly in how neural networks are connected or cycles because you can connect things in a way if there are cycles that then cause problems people particularly like to do acyclic or non-cyclic graphs has that been an issue in in setting up your graphs so i haven't set up or like exactly worked on this graph yet and i am about to do that that's what i am trying to say you like these questions which you are asking i think i will face those all issues in coming a uh, few days but yeah i haven't done it yet all right so the the other thing so so i've i've done some models where we have uh, a graph like this and we have values and uh, okay. we specify the edges and then okay. what we're looking for are the values of the nodes and there are lots of different ways to do that. If the system is linear, you can solve it explicitly, but within a certain factor, because you look to see how many dimensions the system really has. So you can do things like that. Um, in our case, I like to evolve things in time. So uh, you, just, you just let it run and, and see what happens. But what happens, at least in our system, where, where the interactions between the edges and nodes are nonlinear, is that there are only certain attractors. If you let the system run and look at the sets of values of nodes, it usually only winds up with a certain set of value of nodes. Maybe one possibility, maybe others. Depends on what the initial conditions are. So I don't know if you've been looking at the dynamics of this at all. But uh, once you specify the nodes and the values and how the value of the nodes depends on the edges, you can just let the calculation run and see where it winds up. Yeah, sure, sure. I, I can look into that as well. Thank you. Well, can you look at the chat? There is a question. Oh, you're right. Oh, yeah, I can, I can, I can ask. Uh, so um, first of all, I, I was wondering if you kind of already know which software you're going to be using? Is it PyGeometric or, or Sage or, or you still haven't decided? Oh uh, yeah, still I haven't decided anything yet. Okay. Um, then the second question is, so you can, you're specifically looking for like basically bad drug, drug interactions or drug uh, kind of um, uh, when people are like using them wrong um, from experimental data, but a lot of it is actually probably described in the medical literature. Um, like a, if you look at like a, one of the paper databases, um, you can probably uh, extra, extract uh, observations that people saw already. I was wondering if you can uh, incorporate that data as well. So if you're finding certain interactions, would maybe you'll be able to find them in literature as well and, and say, well, we found this group, mm -hmm. but also by like going through a network that learned the papers, we can say, oh, well, in in those papers, they had similar, they discovered similar, uh, similar issues. So you mean not to say just, not just, yeah, not just look at experimental data that, or like a just, you know, collected data, but mm -hmm. At the same time, look at, uh, I try to extract the same information from uh, literature review. Okay, so medical data referring to the, yeah. that part of the data you are saying, right? Yeah, either like uh, I think P, uh, Pina, uh, Pinas uh, or uh, Elsevier or like one of those like medical collection of medical journals that that have all that information. Okay, sure. So it'd be uh, interesting to. Um, not just not just like have your own insights, but actually find the same insights in published literature. And then you can say, oh, well, we found those and we didn't find those. And so those either new or we just like, we, maybe there's an error and we didn't find them or those are 
you know, real and people should, researchers should look at them. Yeah, um, sure. But, uh, we, we can use that already done research and already published results. We can use them to identify them. Yeah. And, and so I, I know like a lot of people who are working on uh, LLMs now, like basically they build, they build this new interfaces where you, you have this question answering chat interfaces to your system. And people are thinking of building it with different like a graph network, knowledge graphs. I was wondering if you were thinking of, and you, you had a page uh, describing it. I was wondering if you were thinking of building that. So let's say you're, you have your network uh, and, and you have your results and can you query your results in, in, in the language model? Like, I don't know how it will look, but, but it would be interesting to see if uh, uh, then basically uh, you can, you can, I mean, you can, you can actually ask questions without having to write uh, uh, like a SQL or some sort of like a, um, you know, formal query. Yeah. The, like there are multiple things to like uh, do with the data, but only underlying thing is that the data is like very, very complex. So considering that factor, what can we do is the main question here. So sure, I, I will uh, check these points as well. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. I, I, have, I have one more question about the underlying data that you're using. So mm -hmm. I know the uh, adverse uh, drug reports that uh, CDC and FDA do are really a wonderful source of data. But, you know, I wonder a little bit, do you have any sense of how either underreported or false reports are there in that database? I mean, you're just taking this data, assuming it's all accurate. I mean, how do you know what the... And the, the reason why I say this, a number of years ago in um, New York City, the health department, uh, maybe about five or six years ago, before the pandemic, uh, looked at social media to look at numbers of food poisoning incidents where people ate in a restaurant and got sick later. And they estimated from the number of things actually reported to the health department, they were probably catching one out of five incidents. So I, I have no idea how you judge the underlying accuracy of the data on which you're building the model. And I know there have been reports of uh, reactions to vaccines, which may or may not be due to the vaccine also. So mm -hmm. how do you deal with the FDA people to know how accurate the starting point of your data is? So uh, that part is going to be tackled in the data cleaning process. Actually, there are so many factors, not only false data, even the data, which is, if even if we consider it as a correct data, that particular person is, uh, the data is not complete or is it, it is not clean. So there are those values, but I would say the volume of data is very huge. So we, we can try our best to pick out the, non-ambiguous data or like a data which is complete and initially try with that sample size and look what we are getting so yeah that those challenges are there like how do how to know if the data is correct or not yeah uh you are you are on mute yeah no but but we're good i think and uh, i will stop the recording okay. hold on a second <laughs>